Welcome to a new night special TikTokers. Nostalgic night dedicated to our biggest fans. You have supported us in each of our projects. You have given us ideas and messages of affection. We feel very grateful because you allow us to dedicate ourselves to what we like the most, telling stories. In today's video, we will relive many of your favorite videos. We want to send a greeting to all of you who accompany us every week. We are more and more in this great family. It makes us very excited. A subscriber has asked us to draw all the creepypastas as if they were going to take a family photo. We thought it was a great idea. It is clear that we cannot fit everyone. There's no room for so many. But let's draw some of them. The kings of creepypastas could not be missing. We're talking, of course, about Jeff the Killer or Slenderman. But they're not the only ones. Lazari, Laughing Jack, Laughing Jill, Jason the Toy Maker. Let's see if you're true fans of creepypastas. How many characters do you recognize? Wow, our illustrator has finished this terrifying image. We love the result. And now, we won't make you wait any longer. Let the nostalgic night begin. It was a wonderful sunny day. A blonde girl named Lucy was playing with her two friends in her home's backyard. They wouldn't stop asking her about her birthday party, which would be celebrated pretty soon. She would boast proudly about how great it was all going to be. A lot of friends would come, the cake would be red velvet with four layers, and she would be using a beautiful blue dress. A car stopped at the entrance and Alex came out of it, Lucy's young personal steward, carrying her new dress. He looked at the girls with resentment. He hated his job. And he hated receiving orders from a spoiled child. Lucy rushed towards Alex, asking him to let her try out the new dress. With a forced smile, he said that her mother didn't allow it, but Lucy just kept on insisting. Completely fed up of it all, Alex decided to execute the plan he had been preparing for months. He walked Lucy to her room so she could try out the dress, while he waited outside. A while later, she came out and flaunted her new dress proudly. When she was about to go show it to her friends, Alice grabbed her by the arm and dragged her to the car, giving her no time to react. He threw her to the back seat and drove away from the house. Don't worry, you will love your new home. Terrified, Lucy didn't try to escape. She was afraid Alex would hurt her. They eventually arrived to a faraway crossroads where Alex met with an older man of about 40 years old, corpulent and with an unkempt appearance. Let me introduce you to Christopher Gray. From now on, you work for him. Enjoy your new life. Alex was left counting a wad of bills while Lucy cried in the back of Christopher's moving van. Once they arrived to the house of her new master, Lucy was put in charge of everything. She had to work day and night without rest and her appearance started to deteriorate. Her skin turned pale with bags under her eyes covered in filth and with her beautiful blue dress now wrecked. She did all she could to not anger Christopher. She cleaned and cooked diligently while he only ate, drank and slept. However, Lucy wouldn't stop thinking about how to escape from that place. She knew that the main door was always locked and she needed time to search for the key. One day, she found Christopher's medications with pills that produced heavy sleepiness. She gradually put doses of the pills in Christopher's food until she found the perfect dose which would give her enough time to carry out her plan. Her birthday arrived and she couldn't stop thinking about how much she missed her family and friends. Thus, she decided that would be the day. After eating, Christopher fell asleep and she searched for the key all over the house. She checked all of the wardrobes, all of the drawers, but found nothing. However, she had a sudden idea. She went back to the living room where Christopher was sleeping and very carefully checked his pockets. She finally found a key, but it was smaller than the door's lock. She looked around and tried the key on one of the drawers in the living room chest. She opened it and found a bigger key inside and a photo album. It had a bunch of photos of young kids, all of them with a worried expression. 
She kept passing the pages and at the end found more photos of the same kids, but all martyred and mutilated. She dropped the book in terror and rushed towards the door with the key. She managed to open it and ran towards the forest, but the noise awoke Christopher, who ran after her. Almost out of breath, Lucy tripped and fell into a deep ditch. She looked around and horrified saw she was surrounded with the corpses of the kids in the photos. Some of the bodies were still decomposing, while others were now skeletons. Christopher caught up to her and dragged her back to the house. I hope you had fun with your new friends, cause you're gonna go back to them soon. She begged for forgiveness and implored for her life. Let's see if you learn not to put your paws where you shouldn't. He grabbed an axe and cut off one of her arms with a swift chop. She screamed in pain and to shut her up, he raised his axe once more and unloaded it right on her head, taking her life. After throwing her body back into the ditch, Christopher sat on his couch and turned on the TV to watch the news. The police had captured Alex as a suspect involved in Lucy's disappearance and he had confessed. Soon they'd be going after him. He rushed to his room to pack his things and flee from his house as soon as possible. Once ready, as he was about to leave, he saw the photo album on the floor in front of the house. You're a heartless evil man. You will regret what you've done. Don't think you will get away with this. He heard laughter, and when he raised his head, he saw in front of him the spirits of the kids he martyred, with Lucy in front of them. Suddenly, a person's screech started to sound, and his eyes started to bleed. He went out of the house, screaming in pain, and saw himself surrounded by many police patrols, which had arrived to detain him. He dropped to their feet, imploring, Make them shut up, please! Weeks later, we see him imprisoned in a padded cell of a mental asylum and wearing a straight jacket. <laughs> Out of nowhere, he started to hear laughter and everything started again. Lucy approached him with a naked skull for a face, eyes that popped out of her eye sockets and sharp teeth. I told you that you wouldn't get away with this. The other kids grabbed him and she burst open his chest. She started raping out his entrails while Christopher choked in his own blood. Can you hear them laughing? One day, the city awoke inundated with eye-catching and colorful posters announcing the arrival of the flamboyant Freak Circus, stopping there as part of their world tour. It would be there for one night only, so it created a real buzz around town. The news quickly spread by word of mouth, and many wanted to see the wonders of such a mysterious event. Strangely, the dusty circus tent was not installed anywhere inside the city, but in an open space in the middle of the dark and inhabited forest, at the outskirts. Probably to give the circus an even more mysterious aura, many people thought. Despite of this, or maybe because of this, hundreds of people went there and got in line at the entrance of the closed gate, impatiently waiting for the show to begin. Soon enough, a dirty and slouching employee dressed in overalls opened the gate and started to collect their money so they could get in. People did what they could to sit in the rusty seats distributed in a stance around a dimly lit stage. This scene looked more like a crowded funeral than a circus show. Behind the curtains, a tall and imposing old man dressed in a dress coat observed with a malicious smile how people kept coming inside the tent. He was the master of ceremonies, who patiently waited for the stand to fill up. Once the stands were full, he made a motion to his hunched helper, and the show began. The master came out of the curtains, ecstatic and with a smile bright like his jacket. He welcomed the public with flamboyance and elegance. No more stunts, no punchlines, he took a bow and made way for the first act. From behind the curtains, the shy and fragile figure of a beautiful girl appeared, who started to sing a happy tune with a perfect voice. Her hair had a pale, turquoise color, and she walked slightly swaying to her sides because of her legs, which were not normal human legs, but goat legs. The contrast between the grace of her singing and her fair limbs was certainly grotesque. When she went back behind the curtains, the public didn't really know how to react. There was a bit of shy clapping here and there, but most people were simply shocked. The master of ceremonies was delighted to see that, and without giving the public a break, he went ahead and introduced the next act. 
From the backstage, a new and macabre creature appeared. It was a bulky character dressed like a clown, but it had two heads. It was difficult to distinguish their features with so much makeup, but you could see that both faces were very similar. The first head, which looked like a man's head, yelled out of happiness and excitement. Oh! Oh! Meanwhile, the second head, which looked like a woman's head, was crying out of bitterness. This time, the public was completely frozen in shock. The strange two-headed clown went backstage after finishing the act in the middle of a stony silence. The master of ceremonies, proud and with his chest risen, announced the next act, the star act of the night. Bloody Angel, the cannibal spirit. The public couldn't be more anxious. The curtains opened and a huge iron cage with wheels came onto the stage, pushed by the hunched helper. Inside of it, among the shadows, a young albino girl could be seen. Her skin was pale, her hair was red, and she looked at people around her with repudiation and resentment. The master opened the cage and pulled the girl into the spotlight where the public could see her mouth shut with a muzzle and her hands and feet chained. After seeing her weak and meek appearance, the public was now perplexed. <laughs> Some couldn't help but laugh. Then the master turned the girl's back to the public, took off her shirt to show off her back, and two weird deformities were hanging from it. Two deformities that kind of looked like wings made of bones. That sight made the laughs stop immediately, and the old master, smiling and with confidence, continued with the act. He removed the girl's muzzle and proceeded to carefully separate her lips with his hands to show her teeth to the public. The teeth were sharp and pointy, like the teeth of a wolf. Whispers of astonishment swept the stands and the girl felt hundreds of eyes were staring at her, looking at her with both pity and disgust. That brought back to her mind a memory she had buried a long time ago. The memory of her previous life, a perfectly normal life with family, friends, and a happy existence. The flashes in her mind continued, showing her visiting the same circus and getting out before the show was over because she was disgusted with what she was seeing. She also saw a flash of arms grabbing her, dragging her into the darkness, holding and imprisoning her in that damn cage. The next scenes playing in her mind were even more blurry and confusing. Scenes of brutal beatings and humiliations, all done to make her forget who she was and force a new personality into her. The personality of a savage cannibal. She saw flashes of surgeries done on a dirty bed, as well as mutilations done with chemicals to transform her into what she was now. And at the end, she felt how her infinite pain went away and how it was replaced with an insatiable appetite for human flesh. After those flashes, the cannibal girl acted quickly. She scrambled and pulled with all her might before the master could react, freeing herself from her captor. She then jumped on the old man, furiously biting his face and devouring half of it. The man was still alive and his screams of agony were drowned by his own blood. The public was now horrified after seeing that terrible and gruesome scene. The girl quickly freed herself from her chains and rushed towards the public, attacking whoever was near her with no mercy. The screams and cries of people running in all directions filled the dusty tent. Some people managed to survive the attack, many of them ending up with deep wounds and even with some of their limbs mutilated. Others were not so lucky and were devoured by the red-haired girl. The master, surprisingly, was one of the few able to escape her clutches. The other circus freaks were also devoured up to the bones by their longtime stage colleague. Once she ended her feast, the albino cannibal simply walked away from that sinister place, leaving behind her a trail of blood on the ground. Say must almost everybody, I'm a big fan of Sonic the Hedgehog. I like the new games, but I don't mind playing the classic ones either. It all started a summer afternoon. I was playing in my room when I heard the mailman leave something in the mailbox. I stopped the game and went for the mail. There was only a CD box and a note. It was from my best friend Kyle. I hadn't heard from him for two weeks. The note looked like it was written in a hurry and it said, Here, I can't take it anymore. I have to get rid of it. I trust you can do this for me. I can't, he's after me. If you don't destroy this CD, he'll come after you as well. It's too late for me. Destroy the CD. Do it quickly. 
Don't even think about playing. That's what he wants you to do. Just get rid of it, please. Kyle. After reading the note, I didn't understand anything. Was Kyle playing with me? I looked at the box and the CD inside it. There was nothing weird. It just had written on it with a black marker the words Sonic.ixi. How could this hurt me? Truth is, I really felt like playing. I've told you already, I'm a big fan of Sonic. I went up to my room and installed the game. When the title appeared, I realized it was one of the first Sonic games. It all seemed normal until, for a fraction of a second, I saw something weird on the startup screen. The sky was getting darker, the title looked rusty and destroyed, the Segus 1991 was replaced by a triple six, and the water had turned red. The most horrifying thing was Sonic's eyes, black and bleeding, with two shiny red dots looking at me. His smile was also scary. When the screen to choose a character appeared, there were Tails, Knuckles and Dr. Robotnik. Now I knew for sure something was going on. I mean, how can you play with Robotnik in a classic Sonic game? At that point, I realized I was playing a hacked game. I kept on with it. I chose Tails and the game froze for like 5 seconds. I heard a chilling laugh. I started to play and I made Tails run as I would have done with any of the classic Sonic games. A flat land and some trees. Not long after, I saw one of the small animals laying dead on the ground, bleeding. Tails had a sad look on his eyes and the music started to slow down. I kept on with Tails, but he seemed affected. Going up a hill, Sonic appeared, leaning on a tree. His eyes were black and he had an evil smile on his face. Tails seemed really scared. The screen turned black for about 7 seconds and a white text appeared that said, Hello, do you want to play with me? What is going on? Tails was on the screen again. He was very scared. He looked at me, terrified. He wanted me to get him out of there. We started running. Suddenly, I heard the chilling laugh again and Sonic appeared with black and red eyes. I kept running with Tails, but Sonic wouldn't stop chasing him, flying, until he got him. He jumped on Tails right before the screen turned black. I heard a cry and a new text appeared again. You are too slow. Wanna try again? Even though I didn't want to keep playing, this time I chose Knuckles. I heard the laugh again and a message showed up. You can't run. In this level, the sky was red and the ground was metallic. Knuckles looked at me, afraid, same as Tails did. I started playing, but that distressing laugh sounded again. Sonic appeared right in front of Knuckles with those evil eyes in a pixelated black cloud of smoke. Knuckles looked desperate. He tried to defend himself, but Sonic got him. The screen turned black and I heard the cry again. What's going on? I got scared for real and decided to stop playing. The game had worn me out, so I fell asleep. But right after, a disturbing nightmare ruined my rest. I could hear Knuckles and Tails crying for help. Had I abandoned them? I gathered all my courage and started to play again. When I started it, I only had Robotnik left to play with. This time, the screen was kind of a hallway with purple walls. There were candles emitting red light and blood drops in the screen. I started running with Robotnik. He didn't seem nervous as the others too did. As he was moving forward, the walls seemed darker and darker. The candles starting to emit a mysterious blue light and the terrible laugh appeared again. He was here. Sonic showed up right in front of Robotnik. He seemed more real this time. His smile was the most horrible thing I had ever seen and his big eyes were crying blood. I was paralyzed with fear. Tails, Knuckles, Robotnik and probably Kyle had disappeared because of this macabre hedgehog. I was going to be the next one. I saw the super realistic Sonic jumping out of the screen. He was coming for me. The screen turned black. At that moment, I nearly passed out. And at last text, in black, appeared on the screen. Ready for round two, Tom? The evil laugh sounded as if Sonic was right behind me. The startup screen appeared, with Tails, Knuckles and Robotnik wiped out. I cried for them. They were trapped forever in that cursed game. I tried to get the game out of my computer, but I couldn't. 
I heard a voice, a whisper. Try and keep this interesting for me, Tom. I turned around and I saw where that voice was coming from. And what I saw made me scream. Sitting in my bed, there was a sonic stuffed animal, smiling with blood stains on its eyes. But this story starts a long time ago, before game consoles hit homes. In the early 1980s, in a town in the United States, panic began when a series of violent deaths followed. The victims had been brutally tortured and killed, and the perpetrator always left the initials TD in blood on the wall. Beyond that, the police had no clue. The most brutal killing took place in a home where six people died and only one survived, with serious injuries. His testimony was chilling. He claimed to have been attacked by a small, blood-covered teddy bear, with a macabre smile full of fangs and from whose eyes flames erupted. On its head, it had a kind of antenna with a red stone, and he acted like a madman, jumping from one side to the other. The police dismissed his testimony, and he was admitted to a mental sanatorium. Days later, he committed suicide. A rumor began to spread around the city that the person responsible for the crimes was not a psychopath, but a demonic entity. And everyone locked themselves in their houses as soon as the sun set. One night, a police patrol found in an alley the remains of a massacred body. And a few meters away, a figure writing the initials TD with blood on the wall. They went after him and were able to chase him thanks to the trail of blood he left up to the outskirts of the city, where he hid in the cemetery. By that time, the alarm had been raised and several patrols began to trace the cemetery. A journalist from a local newspaper also appeared and was allowed to accompany one of the police teams. After a long time of spinning and listening to strange noises, suddenly one of the officers collapsed to the ground, his voice drowned by the gushes of blood coming out of his throat. While the other policeman was helping his partner, the journalist reacted quickly with his camera and took a snapshot in the middle of the darkness. When he later revealed it in his lap, he couldn't believe what he saw. A small teddy bear appeared standing on a tomb, holding in his hand a blood-stained axe. The image confirmed the description given at the time by the previous victim, and when it was published in the press, people got hysterical. It was no longer enough to close doors and windows. Rosaries, incense, holy water, and any other religious object that could protect against that demonic being were used. They went massively to ask the parish priest what they could do in the face of such a threat, and he answered that faith was the only salvation. A vigil of prayers and supplications was summoned and lasted for several days without interruption. People turned to the heavens for help to weaken the monster's power. Suddenly, one night, the creature appeared, kneeling before the priest. Blood and flames gushed out of his eyes stronger than ever, and his desperate cries tried to silence the people's prayers. The priest gathered the cords to stand before him, uttered a few verses and sprinkled him with holy water, at which point the monster gave a scream of pain and exploded like a great blood bubble, soaking everyone present. At last, the curse was over. Everything went back to normal, and people tried to forget that gruesome experience. Until much later, in the late 1990s, when Sega released for its Saturn console a new installment of its star saga, Sonic R. It was a revolutionary three-dimensional racing game that included a couple of secret characters that could be unlocked as rewards. In a home in Los Angeles, California, a mother called her son, who had been locked in his room for hours for dinner, playing this new title. After several unanswered attempts, she went upstairs ready to scold him, but what she found left her disenchanted. Her son lay on the floor with blue lips, foam in his mouth and dilated pupils. The console was on and a song from the game Can You Feel the Sunshine kept looping, with a cheerful tone that gave it all a bizarre atmosphere. It was ruled that the boy had died of an epileptic seizure from playing for too many hours at a time. Which was strange, because he had no family history of this disease. 
After the funeral, the family gave away all his toys and belongings. The video console went to his best friend, who connected it at home and found that just before he died, the boy had unlocked a new character. It was called Tails Doll, the dark version of one of the protagonists of the game, which looked like a stuffed animal with an antenna with a red light on his head. This fact became known on the internet forums and began to spread the rumor that the bloodthirsty TD had returned to action through the macabre character of the video game. Sega didn't take long to react and made it disappear from all its products. But it was too late, and the nightmare became reality again. A few weeks later, there was a new murder. Once again, a brutally tortured corpse and an inscription in blood, this time more extensive. It said, Thank you for your fear and for bringing me back to life. From now on, I won't have a body. I won't need it anymore. Because I am Tails Doll. Alice was a young girl with green eyes and candy-colored hair. She was sweet and intelligent, but very shy and never had any friends. That's why she often created her own. Imaginary friends that she named with a number to differentiate them. There was one in particular that stood out, her first imaginary friend, Zero. For Alice, life was sad until Zero arrived. She was her best friend and always protected her. Zero wore a black sweater, black and white striped gloves and socks, and brown boots. Around her eyes were black circles. Alice would spend all her time with her, and when her parents saw her playing and talking to herself, they got worried and thought about seeking help. One summer day, Alice sat down to sunbathe in her garden. The sun caressed her pale skin. As she sat on the grass, she felt a strange sensation. Something in the depths of her mind urged her to cross to the other side of the street. Barefoot, she headed towards the road. As she looked up, she saw a large white truck coming towards her and she was paralyzed, in shock. There was a loud, squeaking sound as the vehicle turned in another direction, dodging her and falling down the hill until it caught fire. Alice froze pale. She watched as someone crawled desperately out of the vehicle, covered in crimson blood. It was her father, and next to him was her mother, screaming as they burned to death. Mom! Dad! She cried out. It was the last time she saw them. After the accident, she was adopted by her neighbor, Mrs. Rogers. She was an alcohol addict. Alice hated her very much, but she had no one else, no family, no friends. As she grew older, she forgot her imaginary friends. One day in class, Alice was absorbed drawing in her notebook when the teacher caught her attention. Alice, I suggest you pay attention in my classes. I don't think you need another zero. She was confused. Something the teacher had just said bothered her, but she didn't know what. She felt sick, so she asked for permission to go to the bathroom and rest out. When she arrived, she washed her face with cold water, and when she looked up to her reflection, she panicked. She swore she saw someone else. She went back to class and saw how strange red circles were drawn in her notebook. A chill ran through her body. As she left class, she found her only friend, Anne, who had short blonde hair and brown eyes. Hello, Alice. Welcome to Wonderland, said Anne. I'm not in the mood today, Anne, she replied seriously. Come on, cheer up. You have me here for anything. When she arrived home, she went up to her room trying not to make any noise. As she passed through the living room, she held her breath. Here you are, bloody girl, shouted Mrs. Rogers, grabbing her arm. Her breath stunk. Alice screamed. What is this, huh? She said, pushing her towards the kitchen where it was all full of beer cans and boxes of pre-cooked food. I, I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't have time to clean up. I was late for school. I don't need excuses. Don't let it happen again or you'll regret it, I swear. She threw her on the floor and she hit her head with the floor tiles. Alice picked everything up containing her sadness, anger, and confusion. 
The next day, she took another route to school so no one would see her. She walked through the snowy forest in her black sweatshirt, covering the bruise on her face. Just as she got to school, something made her fall. She felt a group of boys laughing at her, her blood boiling with rage more and more intensely. She got up and pushed the boy. She threw him to the ground and started hitting his face nonstop. Alice, stop! She heard screaming. What's wrong with you? We only want to help you. She looked up and saw everyone's horrified expression, including that of her friend Anne. She looked at her bloody knuckles and the boy's smashed face. What have I done? I didn't mean to, she thought. Tears filled her eyes. She stood up and fled into the woods. When she got home, she blindfolded her wounds in the bathroom and saw her reflection in the mirror. What did I just do? I didn't want to. Oh no, of course not. It was me. I just wanted to protect you, answered a voice, using her own mouth. Alice stepped away, surprised. It was unbelievable, but her reflection had just spoken for her. Who, who are you? She asked, stuttering. I'm your best friend, remember? Her head started spinning as she fell to the ground feebly. The voice was inside her head, repeating the same phrase over and over again. I'm your best friend, your only friend, Zero. In the following weeks, the voices stopped. But Alice began to become a different person, more and more irritable and violent. She often suffered sudden attacks and laughed like a mad woman. She felt as if her mind was someone else's. When Mrs. Rogers found out that she had been expelled from school, she got angry and locked her in her room. She sobbed, felt weaker and weaker until one night she fainted. When she woke up, she was on the floor, her whole body hurt. There was no sign of Mrs. Rogers. Relieved, she left her room and went to the living room. She was surprised by news that appeared on television where they said they had found a decapitated woman. She decided to make herself a soup for dinner. A rotten smell struck her. A hammer covered with blood was lying on the floor. Scared, she returned to her room. As she entered, she saw the walls covered with circles drawn in blood and on her bed laid Mrs. Rogers' lifeless head. She ran out of the room in horror, but tripped and fell down the stairs until she reached the floor unconscious. She woke up again in a room full of mirrors that reflected her pale face with tired eyes. Aren't you happy? It's gone. She won't bother you anymore, said the same spooky voice. She turned around, but no one else was there. What are you? A demon! I want answers! Don't you remember me, Alice? I'm your best friend. I'm Zero. We're best friends forever. I had to find a way to protect you. I'm part of your conscience, so I'm you. Whispered the voice. That's not possible. I had to kill your parents. They wanted to separate us, but you still abandoned me. Now I'm getting stronger, said the sinister voice. An uncontrollable rage seized Alice. With her fists, she punched the mirrors. She didn't feel any pain. She didn't feel anything at all. You took everything from me. I have no one because of you. She broke the last mirror and closed her eyes, blinded by a white glow. When she opened them again, she went to the bathroom to look at herself. Both her skin and her hair were completely white. Black circles surrounded her eyes. She began to laugh out loud. Alice was gone and Zero was free. I almost look like a skeleton, only missing the teeth, said Zero. She grabbed sharp scissors and cut out her cheeks in a grin from ear to ear. Blood flowed from the wounds. She took a needle and sewed the flesh. Zero hated the red color, so she stuck her index finger in bleach and pointed at her eyes. When she regained her vision, all the colors had been dyed faded gray, dark black, and blinding white. 
The telephone rang and Zero answered imitating Alice's voice. It was Anne who invited her to her house because she had a gift for her. She picked up her hammer and went out the door impatiently with a psychopathic smile on her face. When Anne opened the door for her, she was shocked. Alice was now a white monster. Scared, she tried to run, but Zero grabbed her arm and threw her to the ground. Alice, what are you doing? shouted Anne in despair. Alice is not coming back, she was a pipsqueak. She laughed out loud. She lifted the heavy hammer and smushed it against her head. With the knife, she tore the skin to remove the bones. One by one, she deposited them on the ground next to the corpse, shaping a skeleton. Only the skull was missing, but it was shattered, so she plunged her hand into the pool of blood and painted a circle where the head should be. Next to the body was a box with a label that read, For Alice. She removed the cover, took the black and white stripped scarf from inside and wore it. Wow, thank you, Anne. That was fun. Now that you're gone, we will finally be zero. Said the martyr as she walked out the door and stepped into the darkness of the forest. One weekend, after going partying with my friends, I was walking back home on my own. A breeze was blowing and I could hear the noise of the hinges. Most people would find it terrifying, but not me. I knew this town very, very well. I have the knife with me. I'm strong and fast. What should I be afraid of? Suddenly, while going under a streetlight, I turned to the alley I usually went to with my friends and I saw someone searching for something inside the trash can. I didn't see the person's face, however, I did hear the creak when his head turned to one side, as if he was an owl. I went back, I was in shock, but right away a smile appeared on my face. I know it's weird for someone to have such a reaction after seeing something so unusual, but I am weird in general. Damn it, drug addicts always doing weird things. I laughed at that thought and kept walking. My boots were hitting the floor and the sound they made seemed to be following a rhythm. I was happy to be alone at home, my mother was working a lot lately and I was pretty much always on my own. It's dark at night, everything around me seemed to be on fire. I'm floating slowly in the dark and confusing world of dreams. You know, that comforting feeling when you know you're asleep, without direction, calm, everything's in peace, while your blurry memories come to your brain. Suddenly, I wake up, I realize my eyes are open, I get comfy in my bed, I blink a couple of times and my eyes get used to the darkness. I sit there for a while, wondering what has woken me up. I'm about to nestle between the soft sheets again, but right before I do, a strange sound calls my attention. It didn't sound very strong, so I assumed it was coming from the street. It was probably cats. Stupid animals. I hated it when cats woke me up. Annoyed, I laid on the bed, which bounced a little. The sound didn't stop and it synchronized with my head. Was it a crack on the wall? Was it real or was it just in my head? I sat up again, the sheets sliding between my arms. While one of my hands was laying on the bed, the other one was looking for the knife in my night table. My fingers felt the handle and grabbed it. Maybe I was exaggerating, but better safe than sorry. I grabbed the knife firmly, closer, as if it was downstairs. It sounded like steps, I could hear the sound slowly in my corridor. I had no doubt there was somebody in my house. I felt a tingling while my hair stood on end. My heart was beating like a gust of adrenaline through my body. It was frozen like a marble sculpture. I didn't even dare to breathe. I could feel each beat resounding in my body. If I made any noise, whatever was out there in the hallway could hear me. What should I do? Scream? Ask for help? Attack him? Kill him? Hide? Determined, I jumped off the bed. I saw the shadow of feet in front of my door. A crack of light invaded my room. However, there was a shade covering most of it. I was breathless, but my heart kept beating. A cold sweat took over me. The hinges were making noises. The door was wide open. I tried to scream. I was paralyzed. Suddenly, the alley and the trash can came to my mind. 
It was the same person, the same figure. A shiver ran down my spine. I only had the strength to say no. I could see whoever was shocking me was a man. His face was completely hidden by orange glasses, a hood over his forehead and something covering his mouth and his chin. He got close, staggering a bit. He was coming slowly and sinisterly towards me. He put his hand on his face. Shh. I went back towards my bed. I was holding the knife so firmly that my knuckles were bleeding. I realized the man had an axe on his hand, a lot more impressive than my little knife. I could see blood dripping from it. The intruder held the axe up, blood was running down it. I couldn't move and I let my knife go little by little. It fell noisily on the ground. I stifled a cry and I heard a sound. Shh, he said again, while he kept walking towards me. I noticed his neck was at an inhuman angle. I heard the noise of his bones, his tendons, the sound of death. I couldn't escape, I couldn't move, I was waiting for it. My heart was beating faster and faster, everything was getting blurrier. I felt I was gonna pass out. His body was moving weirdly. He took another step closer, his neck looked like it was cracking. That mysterious noise again, that sounded familiar now. Shh, he said once again. He was only a step away from me. He raised his axe. I was gonna die. His axe got closer to me, slowly. I could feel it touching my stomach. In that moment, I felt a hand on my shoulder, lifting me a bit, enough to feel the blade cut in my abdomen. Agony was all around me. My body was rigid, fear, shock. I couldn't see the night stars anymore. My vision turned black and white. My world spinned around. The last thing I saw was a pair of shoes with silver point and the puddle of blood reaching the shoes of the intruder. And then, my world turned black and numb. It was a sunny summer day. My five-year-old son, James, was playing in the backyard. James had always been a quiet boy with a wild imagination. But he was a bit of a lonely soul, he never had many friends. I was in the kitchen feeding our dog when I heard James talking to someone in the backyard. Was it a friend? I decided to go out to see how he was doing. When I reached the backyard, I was a little confused. James was the only person there. Was he talking to himself? I swear I heard another voice. At that moment, I called him. He came in and sat at the kitchen table. I made him a turkey sandwich and he began to eat it silently. Who were you talking to before? I asked. James looked up for a moment. I was playing with my new friend, he said smiling. I served him some milk and kept asking, does your friend have a name? Why don't you ask him if he wants to come eat with us? James looked at me for a moment before answering. His name is Laughing Jack. Ah, oh, really? That's a strange name. And what does your friend look like? He's a clown. He has long hair and a big nose, long arms and big pants with the striped socks and he's always smiling. At that moment, I realized that my son was talking about an imaginary friend. I assumed that it was normal for boys his age to have imaginary friends, especially if there were not many real ones to play with. I didn't give it much thought, it must be a phase. The rest of the day went by as usual. It was night and I put James to bed. I tucked him in, kissed him goodnight, and made sure to turn on his lamp before closing the door. I was very tired, it was hard to be a single mother. I went to bed and I had a horrible nightmare. It was all dark. I was in a kind of weird abandoned street fair running like crazy. I was very scared. The whole place looked horrible, black and white. There were stuffed animals hanging on ropes in the booths with sickly smiles soon on their faces. I felt as if hundreds of eyes were looking at me, even though there was no one in sight. Suddenly, I began to hear the music of the children's song, Pop Goes the Whistle. I was hypnotized. I followed the tune to the circus tent, almost in a trance. It was completely black, the only light came from a projector that shone in the center of the big tent. While walking towards the light, I found myself singing the song, unable to stop myself. All around the cobbler's bent, the monkey chased the weasel, the monkey thought he was all in fun, pop goes the weasel. The lights came on suddenly, leaving me almost blind. All I could see was a small dark silhouette coming towards me, then another appeared, and another, and another. There were dozens of them. 
I couldn't move, I was frozen, the silhouettes were children. But they were horribly disfigured and mutilated. Some had cuts all over their bodies, others had burns, and others had their limbs mutilated, even the eyes. The children caught me and scratched me, dragged me to the ground and tore my insides. As the children did all that to me, all I could hear was a laugh, a horrible and evil laugh. I passed out. I woke up the next morning, sweating all over. I sat up and noticed that some of James' action figures looked at me from my night table. James had probably woken up early and put his toys there. I picked up his toys and headed to James' room. He was sound asleep. How strange. I placed the toys and headed to the living room. James woke up a little dazed. Maybe he hadn't slept well either. I gave him his breakfast. James, did you put the toys in Mum's room this morning? Laughing Jack did it. Well, tell Jack that he has to pick them up after playing. James nodded and finished his breakfast. He went to play in the backyard. I was so tired that I sat on the couch for a moment and fell asleep. When I woke up a couple of hours later, I realized that James was alone. Shit. I went to the backyard, but James was not there. I started calling him, James, James, where are you? At that moment, I heard a small laugh coming from the front yard. <laughs> James was sitting on the sidewalk. I breathed in relief. James, how many times have I told you to stay in the backyard? Wait, what are you eating? James looked at me and then reached into his pocket, pulled out a bunch of candies, many different colors. Who gave you candies? James looked at me without saying anything. James, please, tell mom who gave you the candy. James lowered his head and said, Laughing Jack, he gave them to me. He was going to give me a heart attack. James, I've had enough of this Laughing Jack. He is not real. I need to know who gave you those candies. James responded in all honesty. But mom, Jack gave me the candies. I closed my eyes, took a deep breath. I knew James would never lie to me, but what he was telling me was impossible. I had him spit out the candy, it seemed fine, maybe some neighbor had given it to him. That night, we went to bed early. Suddenly, I heard a noise coming from the kitchen. I ran downstairs. It was horrifying. Everything was lying on the floor, our dog was dead and hanging from the lamp. His stomach was torn open and filled with colorful candies. I heard a loud scream coming from James's room. Ah! I grabbed a knife and ran up. Everything was on the floor. My poor son was in his bed crying and trembling with fear. I took him in my arms and we ran outside. We called the police from a neighbor's house. When I told them what had happened, they looked at me like I was crazy. They said probably someone had broken into steel and escaped quickly after. I knew it wasn't true. What was in my house didn't come from outside. It was already inside. The next day, I didn't let James go out to the backyard. At night, I took the baby monitor to my room to watch him. James was afraid of Jack, poor boy. I promised him that nothing would happen to him. I went to bed with the biggest knife in the drawer and said, imaginary friend or not, I won't let anything harm my son. I tried to stay awake as long as I could, but in the end, sleep took over me. Is James asleep? I heard the horrible laugh from my nightmare. I jumped out of bed and quickly grabbed the knife. I ran to James' room. I felt a thick hot liquid on my feet. The light suddenly came on and I could see with absolute horror what was in front of me. My little James's body on the wall. I puked on the floor. I heard a grotesque laugh behind me. I turned around and from the shadows came the demon responsible for all this horror. It was Laughing Jack. His white skin and long black hair penetrating white eyes and disheveled feathers on his shoulders. His body was gross, his long arms hanging beyond his waist. His crooked smile revealed a row of sharp white teeth. He wore a black and white suit like a clown with a long-sleeved shirt and striped socks. He let out a disgusting laugh. He approached James. Get away from him! I ran to the monster, raising the knife and stabbed him. But as soon as the knife touched him, he disappeared into a cloud of black smoke. The knife passed through James and bored him. James's heart was still beating, splashing his hot blood on my face. What have I done? My baby, my heart, I killed my baby. I immediately fell to my knees. I could hear the sirens in the distance, louder and louder. 
My son, my baby, my sweet baby. I promised that mom would protect him, but I failed. I'm sorry, James, I'm so sorry. I bursted into tears, kneeling in front of what was still my son's body. The police soon arrived and found me holding the knife covered in the blood of my poor offspring. They blamed me for the murder of my son and declared me crazy. They locked me up where I've been for the past two months. The only reason I'm constantly awake is because someone is playing Pep Goes the Weasel outside my window. Every day. All the time. They say that some time ago, the hanged corpse of a woman appeared in the middle of the forest. It was Loretta Swan, a single mom who had an only child. Her daughter, Lazari. A manuscript was found near the body, written as a goodbye letter, and this is what it said. My dear Lazari, when you read this letter, you will have many unanswered questions. I hope that you can one day forgive me for the pain and agony I've caused you, and especially for leaving you alone from now on. I've been struggling for too long and the madness is consuming my mind. However, before I go, I want you to know the truth. You know I've always been very devout and religious, dedicated to fulfilling the will of God. My faith has always been unshakable, even when I discovered I was hysterical and could never have children. Even then, I simply went on, determined to find love in a righteous and good man. One day, I was in the library checking some books, looking for quotes for a sermon, and I had the feeling someone was watching me. That was the first time I saw him. He was the most handsome man I've ever seen, with a shining and attractive gaze. We smiled at each other until I finally approached him, and we introduced ourselves to each other. His name was Evan Harrison. Shortly after, we started going out, and I opened my heart to him almost by accident. It was inevitable, as there was something very captivating about him. Something unreal and divine. I trusted him with my life and my secrets, although he never wanted to talk about himself. He knew I was sterile, but even then he convinced me to try having the child I so much desired. And somehow we did it! I got pregnant and I started to think he was some kind of divine being. And that's how I gave birth to you, Lazare. And you had the same divine and captivating aura your father had. However, little by little, everything turned dark and evil. Evan suddenly disappeared, abandoning me without explanation. And despite that, you and me kept going forward. You grew up happily by my side, and every day I loved you more. Everything changed the day of your fourth birthday. Your captivating aura transformed into something evil. Your eyes no longer reflected innocence. Instead, they reflected a red glimmer, like the fires of hell. I started doing research and reading religious books, looking for an explanation of what was happening. One day, while I was reading at home, I heard horrifying screams in the yard. I ran outside and I saw you attacking our neighbor who was lying on the ground. I saw you biting and devouring his flesh, as if you were a ravenous dog attacking his prey. Even your body had mutated, as you now had claws, hooves, pointed teeth, and a strange opening in your chest, like a second mouth. When I called you, you went back to your normal form, and ran to hug me with tears in your eyes. I couldn't allow anyone to find out about this. I couldn't allow anyone to snatch my Lazari away from me. Thus, I got rid of the corpse and chained you up in the basement. I spent many sleepless nights researching what was happening until I finally found an answer. Zalgo. Your father is a demon and I gave myself to him in order to create you. And the worst part is that now you are transforming into a dark being, losing your heart in the process. That's why I locked myself in the basement with you and did whatever I could to expel that evil within you. All the rituals and suffering I made you go through were for you to become the same sweet girl you used to be. But I was hurting you too much with those exorcisms and I was hurting myself too. I even tried to look for Zalgo and summon it, but it never answered my call. 
damn him a thousand times for destroying my life and my daughter's life. Now it wants to capture you and use you through me, but I will not allow him to do it. So please, listen to me, Lazari. Run away as far as you can, be always alert and do not trust anyone. I love you and will always love you. The little eight-year-old Lazari, while hacking her teddy bear, was observing the corpse of her mother hanging from a tree. Lazari was now alone and had nowhere to go. She started to wander through the forest until she bumped into a strange figure. It was a tall and faceless man wearing a suit who also had tentacles coming out of his back. Lazari wanted to know him and be his friend, so she extended her hand. The figure took her by the hand and took her with him. Lazari Natalie Swan is the protagonist of the creepy pasta comic I Eat Pasta for Breakfast. She's a human demon hybrid known as a Zalgoid. She was found by a Slenderman in a forest and lives in a house with other creepy pastas. Sometimes she transforms involuntarily and attacks other supernatural beings to devour them, although she no longer attacks humans. She can only see in different shades of red and is unable to perceive other colors. On her back, she has severe scars she got when her mother tried to expel the demon inside of her body. However, just like any other 8-year-old girl, she likes playing, coloring and being around people. She gets along very well with Lulu, who is like her older sister, and is also secretly in love with eyeless Jack, especially because he also eats his victims. But that is only when she's in her human form, her more innocent and harmless form. When she attacks, she adopts her hungry form and she behaves in a completely savage way. She acts like an animal trying to hunt to prey, without any kind of mercy. When she goes back to her human form, she's incapable of remembering what happened and she also seems regretful for whatever she might have done. She also has a third form, her Zalgoid form, which she has adopted in several locations but nobody has seen. And this is fortunate, because that is her most violent and lethal form, where she displays her demonic essence in its purest form. Nina was yet another teenager who would have to spend Valentine's Day alone. She threw herself on the bed, sighing. She was exhausted after an afternoon of hard work. She put her laptop on her legs and started to check out her social media. Everyone's statuses were filled with hard emojis, photos of hugs and mushy phrases. Seeing that made her sick, and it's not like she gets sick easily. But suddenly, she realized the stubborn she was feeling in her stomach was due to something different. Or rather, someone different. She searched a profile. The profile of a boy named Jeffrey Woods. She opened the chat tab. And there they were, dozens of messages written by her with no response from Jeffrey. She felt very sad and a tear started to go down her cheek. She wiped the tear using a corner of the blanket, but then she realized she had stained her cheek with blood. The blood came from the body of a girl that laid by her side, just as if she were a horror doll. Nina casually set aside the body with a kick. It fell on the floor face down, revealing several stabbings on her back. Filled with gloom, Nina looked at the splashes of blood on the wall, as well as an inscription written in blood that said, Sleep with me, my love. That was another message for the same recipient. Nina looked back at the chat window and hesitated about writing yet another message. Outside of the house, Jeff was crouching while he observed Nina laying on the bed. He had been following her lately and was having a great time observing her massacres. It really seemed the pupil was best in the master. It was awesome how with just a couple of knife movements she entered the parents in the living room. And the way she savagely stabbed that girl in the back? You could tell that Nina had the same spirit and bloodlust as Jeff. Maybe he was starting to feel something for her? The vibration on his phone interrupted his thoughts. He had a new message from Nina Hopkins. He observed her again, laying on the bed, typing on her laptop, and the smile in his whitest face turned more marked and evil. 
he stood up and went away from that place while answering the message on his phone. Evening came and Jeff arrived at the doorsteps of a small restaurant in the outskirts. He covered his head with his hood. He looked at the entrance. It was filled with pompous decorations with hearts and cupids everywhere with a sign that said, Today, a special Valentine's Day dinner. That made him feel sick, as he strongly held a knife he had hidden under his hoodie. His lust for killing increased and he put his eye on a woman in the side alley. It was most likely one of the employees taking out the trash. He was about to rush towards her, but managed to contain himself. There would be enough time for that later. But for now, he was waiting for someone else. In the alley, Eve threw some trash bags into the trash container while dreading the several work hours she still had before her. That was the date she hated the most in the entire year. The hypocrisy, the unnecessary spending, the ridiculousness of it all. And all for people to go back to arguing and yelling at each other the next day, showing their true selves. Moreover, her boss required her to wear that embarrassing pink uniform, smile at all times and congratulate the customers. When she came back into the restaurant, for a moment she reveled the idea of grabbing one of the knives in the kitchen and venting off all of her frustration by becoming the author of the biggest Valentine's Day massacre in history. But that was just dark humor, she told herself. She would never do something like that. When she was heading back to the kitchen, she saw a couple of young people come into the restaurant, a couple of creepy and weird teenagers. As soon as Jeff and Nina went in, a waiter stopped them and asked them if they had a reservation. Um, Jeff said, Of course, here it is. And with a swift movement, Jeff sliced the throat of the waiter, stopping him from uttering another word. Huh, we can sit whatever we want. Thank you. Here, have a tip said Jeff as he proceeded to stab the waiter in the gut, finally ending his suffering. Jeff and Nina gave a quick glance to the half a dozen tables occupied with couples who were having a romantic dinner. Jeff told Nina, What do you think, my love? You go for the ones on the right and I go for the ones on the left? Nina responded, Um, I'd rather go for the ones on the left because that's the side where the heart is. And thus, with knives in hand, Jeff and Nina quickly pounced over their victims. The first couples died practically without realizing what was going on. The next ones were unable to react, paralyzed in fear due to such a macabre show. The last couples had a small chance to escape, but Jeff and Nina quickly cut them off, making it impossible for them to run away. Jeff's and Nina's synchronization as a couple of killers was truly lethal. When they had finally killed all of the couples, a deadly silence filled the place. The two of them looked at each other's eyes and she decided to get closer and kiss him. But Jeff stopped her in the last moment. Honey, wait! We're not done yet! Nina nodded, trying to hide her embarrassment. Then the two killers split up to finish the job. Jeff went towards the kitchen and Nina went to the toilets. When Nina got into the women's toilet, she saw how all of the stalls were empty, except for one. She remained very still, attentively listening in silence, until she heard someone gasping. She rushed towards the occupied stall, opening the door with a kick, and found a female cook curled inside and paralyzed in terror. In a very sly way, Nina said, Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't know it was occupied. In the kitchen, Jeff looked around carefully, but didn't see anybody. He turned away to leave the kitchen, but all of a sudden, Eve came out of her hiding place under a cabinet. And armed with a kitchen knife, rushed towards Jeff and stopped him in the shoulder. Jeff fell on the floor, and Eve quickly searched for something to finish him off, but a hard time was not enough. Witnessing what had happened, Nina furiously rushed into the kitchen and knocked down Eve making Eve hit her head and fall unconscious. Whoa, another sour puss who hates Valentine's Day, huh? It is because you don't have someone to spend it with? Nina and Jeff looked at each other with passion once again. Maybe a change of look might help her find someone, said Nina while pointing at a bottle of bleach in a cabinet. When Jeff saw it, he looked at Nina with a hopeful smile. 
Minutes later, when policemen arrived, they witnessed what can only be described as a macabre show. Everyone present in the restaurant had been savagely killed. Only a waitress had survived, who now had several burns on her face. On each table, the corpses of the couples remained seated, with their hearts extracted from their chests and put close together on the table. On the wall, there was a message written in blood that said, now go to sleep, lovers. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like it. And if you want to see more Draw My Life videos, subscribe to our channel. See you in the next episode.